everyone, welcome to Station F. We're the biggest startup campus in the world, and today we're having Mikkel Svein, CEO of Zendesk. Hi, Mikkel. Hello. We're very glad to have you. Thank you for coming. I guess I want to ask a few questions about your, your background as an entrepreneur. Sure. And um, going back to the early days uh, as a startup founder, what made you start Zendesk? How did you come up with the idea? <laughs> so we are three founders of Zendesk and uh, two of us spent a few years in the customer service industry uh, and was just like underwhelmed with, the, with the, the systems that existed back then. So we just wanted something that could, that you as a consumer, as a customer, gave you a much better experience and started with that and build a system that was just easy to use, that you could purchase online and then work online and work for how customers want to interact today. And, and uh, one thing took the other and boom, here we are today. Great. So you actually witnessed the problem that you wanted to solve with the software? <sighs> yeah. <laughs> we wanted the most structured startup. Like we didn't write a business plan. We had no idea about the market. We just felt and in, intuitively that there was an opportunity here, something we could do better. Um, and then we were also like in our mid thirties, you know, and maybe this was our last chance to succeed at this. So I think that played a role too. Nice. That's interesting. I guess one of your first investors was a pretty cool guy from Germany. How did you manage to uh, to land this first investor? That was so he was a he was an angel investor, Christoph Jans, uh, who's now with the Point Nine Capital. But we had almost given up on raising any money here in Europe. Uh, like so, you bootstrapped at first. We bootstrapped a lot then uh, for some years, and we we raised some money from family and friends, which I cannot recommend. <laughs> Um, really? Why, why, that, why is that? No, because like, you know, like we've been very fortunate, you know, our families and friends that invested in Zendesk, they are in a good place now. <laughs> okay. But in most cases, that's not how it plays out. In most cases, people are going to lose their money and, and you don't necessarily want to want to do that to your friends and families. Okay. So, but anyway, Christoph was a, was a fantastic guy. He really, truly helped us mature a lot of our things, help us write a business plan, help us write kind of our business model, uh, help us introduce us to a lot of VCs in the US and, and really help us take us to the next level. But this was back then, there was almost no angel investors in Europe. This is, we're talking eight, 10 years ago. Um, so uh, we were just incredibly fortunate that somehow Christoph, he stumbled on us and that we could put something together. How did you meet? Did you send him an email? Or? It, it was all online um, and he actually initially reached out to us. Uh, right. He's that good. Yeah. Crazy story. So yeah, you are one of the top examples of a successful <laughs> European startups. Oh wow. Yes, you are. <laughs> so much pressure. Um, and you got so European investors and then you decided to move to San Francisco where your HQ are right now. Yep. Can you tell us maybe what, according to you, are the strength points for European, the European ecosystem when it comes to startups? So back then there was a very, there was almost no European ecosystem. Eight, 10 years ago, like I'm from Denmark, we built the company out of Copenhagen. There, are no, there were no VCs there, almost impossible to raise money. And like there wasn't a startup ecosystem. It wasn't like, it wasn't well respected. Um, and it's just very, it's, it's very demoralizing for a startup that no one believes in you. So we, at that point, we, we simply had to get away from, from Europe. We had to get to somewhere where you felt appreciated, where you could meet people that could help you think bigger and, and help you build your company. And we found that in Silicon Valley in San Francisco that has a very unique uh, ecosystem. So what, what did San Francisco bring you as a startup when you came Everything. there? Everything. Has, it has 30, 40 years of experience building startups. You know, so that's a lot of experience. There's, of course, a lot of great talent, but it's combined with great experience. People have done it before. People have done it several times before. Uh, so you can hire some incredible people there. And then you have all the other startups. Then you, you're like, cool things are happening everywhere, right around the corner. Uh, every, everybody's disrupting each other and you have access to all the capital. That's a lot of capital, a lot of business development opportunities, a lot of early adopters for technology too. So it's a really, really thriving ecosystem and that makes the whole difference. And uh, what's, how's the European ecosystem now? Well, I think a lot has changed over those 10 years. Like we definitely see budding uh, ecosystems all over Europe. And what we are seeing here today in France is, is, is really impressive and, and uh, we want to be part of it. Great. Going back to your story, were you ever tempted to be acquired at some point or did you ever know uh, what you wanted to achieve going uh, up uh, all the way to, to the IPO? Yeah. Um, 
So no, we did first of all, we didn't know like that we wanted ultimately to take this company public. That's that's that never crossed our minds when we when we built this company. But we wanted to keep pushing it. We wanted to see how far we could take this and and, and then we realized at some point that taking it to public was part of that story. And if you are a popular startup, if you are a hot startup, you know, people will try to acquire you all the time. And that happened to send us too. What you have to evaluate is kind of like what are they willing to kind of buy the company for versus what if you with your own hard work and continual investment what is the value that you, that you can build yourself and if you believe that you can build more value than somebody is willing to pay for your company today you should continue to do that but at the same time you also have to kind of you need to want to do it like you 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 have to be driven by passion and, and you have to be driven by an ambition to to want to change things and do some cool stuff and and have a lot of fun along the way and and i think both of these things have driven us to where we are today according to you or maybe that could be an inspiration for, for your for younger entrepreneurs what does it take to build a billion dollar company today <laughs> it takes a lot of hard work uh, it does like persistence perseverance just like getting up every morning working hard every single day it's, it's like it's like uh, cycling a tour de france you know there's a new mountain every single day and you have to be a little crazy to want to do that you know <laughs> you have to be a little broken but you also like you have and i think that's important for startups to remember like you have to be very lucky you know uh, timing coincidences plays a big role when you build a startup and we've been very fortunate uh, we've been very lucky along the way um, and, and you have to, these two things kind of feed each other. You have to be, you have to work very hard to be very lucky. And we work very hard, we we're very lucky, and, and here we are today. Congrats, that's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> A bit um, about your book, what made you decide to share your experience with uh, fellow startups and readers? Do you think it's important to it give back to the ecosystem? Terrible idea to write that book. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a lot more work than you realize. <laughs> and, and I did it right at the point in time when we went public too, so I cannot so recommend it. So you wrote it yourself? I can, well, I, I'm, I'm, you, I'm working with a co-writer that can write actually and can <laughs> help build a storyline and a narrative. Mm -hmm. and, but uh, it's a lot of work, so I cannot recommend it. Uh, <laughs> doing it while you also take your company public, <laughs> but it, it's like you know, as as a company grows, it's you feel a need for kind of anchoring the story, like why we are where we are today, and and be having that somehow in a way so people who are interested in the company, and that means people who work in the company, that means people who buy from the company, that means people who invest in the company, that means people one way or the other you know working with the products of the company can have that piece of you know information that they can relate to and and get an idea about what are the values of this company where do they come from and like why do they why do they look the way they do today so it was it's it's a way of anchoring the story and 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 i hope also like it i'm a little bit an outsider in the silicon valley san francisco ecosystem because you know it i'm not born up with that i'm not native to all of that and i still feel like an outsider in many ways really? and it's been fun to actually describe how my how, how I thought about Silicon Valley in San Francisco and I think that can be a little bit of inspiration for a lot of especially European entrepreneurs that thinks about uh, Silicon Valley. Interesting. Um, is there something you chose not to write about? In yes, your book? yes, <laughs> yes. Is it secret or can you share it? No, no, <laughs> no, I cannot share that. <laughs> no, but there are, um, when you write something like that, there are things that you have to be considerate uh, about. Uh, but that said, like I didn't want to build, I didn't want to write like a polished book. You know, it was important that we shared the real story with all the the good and the bad things that happened. We wanted to give a very honest uh, view into that. I didn't want to, you know, uh, put lipstick on whatever story that was because I think there's a lot of authenticity is is a big part of how we think about the company and and being able to tell the story in an honest way was important for me. So I haven't tried to uh, I haven't tried to make things look better than they did, um, but I did have to. There were things I couldn't write about, unfortunately. Of course. So in this book, you tell a lot of anecdotes uh, of uh, how you uh, built the desk from the ground up. Can you tell us maybe one that was particularly interesting to you or that you learned from the most? <laughs> <laughs> maybe it will uh, encourage people to read the rest of the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, there are so many great experiences and, 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 uh, and uh, learnings from, from, uh, from our journey. Maybe I think one of the things that most founders don't realize is just how hard 
It is the dynamic between multiple founders, how fragile that relationship is and, and how easily you can mess it up. Learning to go into that experience and, and embracing the, the weaknesses of your co-founders the same way that you have a lot of weaknesses yourself and, and, and having them embrace your weaknesses, uh, going into that with an open mind and, and helping each other be their best, I think is one of the things that you sometimes don't realize when you build a company. So we've had some lessons there. Uh, it's definitely not been easy, but we've, we've, uh, we've come out on the other side and like, a, like an old marriage, like we, we, we do well together. Okay, that's interesting. General questions, what are your next goals with Dendesk? <laughs> so we have aggressive goals. We, we continue to grow very, very rapidly. We, today we have business with 1,600 employees. We have 14, 15 offices around the world. We have almost 100,000 businesses using our software. We have continued to have aggressive goals. We're going we're gonna to release a lot of products that are going to help businesses support the overall customer experience, help them understand their customers be much better, and help them automate a lot more of their processes. And we're going to continue to expand geographically. We are in 150 countries, but there's still areas of the world where we have not uh, penetrated the way we want to. Um, and then we're going to continue to go upstream in the market. More and more large businesses, enterprises is starting to use our products and, and, and that's a huge growth opportunity for us. Great. Um, it's a good transition because I guess one of your next goals is also Station F. Yes. So you discovered Station F today, biggest startup campus in the world. You're launching a startup program there for startups uh, regarding uh, customer experience. What are your initial thoughts about the project? What do you think about Station Air? Now, it is big and it's extravagant <laughs> and it's, it's French and it's amazing, you know? It's really going to be exciting for us to be part of this journey. In many ways, what, what Sevier is trying to do here is kind of taking all the best elements of the startup communities around the world, like, like San Francisco, California, and condensing it down to a small places. So inviting companies like us in, inviting other American companies in, uh, getting startups in here, providing services, and, 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 and building this, this thriving community of, of ideas, of concepts, of disruption, and, and creating relationships amongst, amongst all these companies. It's going to be super interesting. We're really proud about being part of this. We're really humbled by the opportunity, uh, and we, we look very much forward to see what's coming out of this. Thank you so much for being here. No, thank you. And see you soon at Station F. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Thank you.